Man, can can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly, man. It's it's perfect, beautiful, perfect. man. I'm I'm perfect. loving the exuberance, man. You 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 beaming, you beaming on the on, on the screen, man. I'm loving it, man. Look, I'm man, loving that's, it. That's what, that's what we gotta do, man. That's what, that's what we gotta do out here in these streets. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Black Smile. <laughs> yes, brother. Yes, man. All day. How's it going, man? I'm good, man. Just taking it one day at a time, man. Just um, today's my day off. Today was my day to just focus right. on content for day that is not a now. You know, I posted a couple of interviews I did uh, the past couple of days, um, yeah. trying to broaden the exposure. You know what I mean? Because you know that is now is about um, men of color, but also the dynamic. Because there's so many topics that uh, affects men of color. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So I'm trying to hit every every topic. You know, I'm not trying to exclude every. I'm not trying to exclude anybody, man. So let me just say this, man. I just, once congratulations on on just the the movement that you, that you're causing and, and creating. Um, I mean, I've been in the fatherhood game for quite a long time, so I was in the game when there was like hardly anybody really talking about fatherhood in the way that's been truly effective. So now to be able to see, you know, so many men like yourself and myself who are saying, you know, what, hey, the conversations have to be had about our narratives, our stories, and they are they they matter and they're important. So any time I get an opportunity to support another brother and, and shine a little light on, on what it means to be a father, I'm in on it, brother. So I'm really honored to be here with you today. So, yeah. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. And I'm loving what you're doing, too, man, because you've been in the game for a minute, man. You've been touching the subject. Bro, you, you I'm looking at the, great, I, I'm, looking at the, I'm looking at the great beard. I'm looking at the, gr the grayness, man. So you've been there in the minute for a minute. So you, <laughs> you've been trying to work hard to, to yeah. change that narrative, man. And so you kind of paved the way for people like me. So I want to honor you too, man, because you're like that unsung hero. You know, yeah. like 50 years from now, people are going to talk about you. They're not talking about you now, but 50 years from now, they're going to be talking about you. Well, in the words of one of my brothers, man, he says, iron sharp as iron. So I, 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 man, I, I received that. I totally I received that. Yeah. And, you know, you're a man that wears different hats, man. You do so much, man. You're a motivation speaker. You do yeah. so much, man. Um, uh, before we get into the comic book, um, uh, fatherhood, let's talk about your journey. You know, um, I did listen to your NPR when you had the conversation with your son, and that was wow. really powerful, man. Okay. Um, okay. You know, you know, the 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 title was uh, was it uh, a boy raising a man? Yeah. So, so can you talk about that? You know, being sixteen years old bringing this um taking this uh major responsibility so can you take me back to that time yeah man i could totally take you back it was uh <laughs> it was december 30th 1994 um he was seven pounds three ounces 21 inches long born on december 30th um and it was actually 9 55 in the morning and i remember um cutting the umbilical cord separating him from his mother um i remember um holding him for the first time and looking down at him and him looking at me and me in that moment making this instant connection that I was going to be um, involved and active in his life. Um, even though I didn't necessarily have a father figure in my journey, I just knew from the experiences that I've had in my life that this was he was going to be the one that I was going to do everything I could. Now, the challenge that I faced is that I said all that and made that commitment when I saw him. But the big issue came into play when it was really time to, to act out what it means to be a father. And here I am, a 16 year old boy, not really clear about who I am and what I am and what I'm supposed to do in the world. And now I'm sitting here with a whole nother life. Um, and I went from being just a 16-year-old dad uh, to a 17-year-old single parent. Um, and my son was actually born through the foster care system. So it's really crazy when I think about my experience as a dad at, at that young of an age and the challenges that him and myself and his mother went through um, as we were we were really in the foster care system um, and the impact that that had on all of our lives. But man, it was life changing for me. Um, and I, I knew at that time I was the best thing that I was going to do is just be present and active in his life. And um, now, now he's 25 
And I, I see him and I say, wow, he is definitely a reflection of um, my journey as a dad. And now he's a father as well. And sort of, you know, and taking on this new fatherhood role and his journey is completely different than my journey. Um, and so we have had so many challenging talks around what it means to be a father, even though we have very different um, journeys as it relates to that. Um, but yeah, man, it was probably one of the hardest experiences I've had. I can remember always talking about, um, even though I didn't have a physical father, I used to watch um, TGIF. So right. I remember, I remember. Like, uh, Heathcliff, Heathcliff Huxtable. Um, yeah. I even used to watch Little House on the Prairie, man. Charles Ingalls. Not the only one, man. <laughs> I'm, letting that, I'm letting people know out there in the social media world, yes, I did watch yeah. that. That yes. is... Um, Boys, boy, meet world. Yes, I watched that. Well, yeah. Yes, bro. Me, me too. Me too. And, you know, it was it was in those narratives and in those stories that I really um, saw what men could become in the lives of their children. Um, and I think when I think about even you know the comic book that I've created, it is the this essence that. Um, Social media stories have an impact. Narratives have an impact on how we see and experience the world. And I knew that those experiences that I, I saw with um, Family Matters, um, George Jefferson, those guys really had an impact on my life. And so I thought to myself, well, man, media plays a huge role in how we how we see ourselves. And it's coming with this reflection of, of that kind of concept of really changing the narrative. And so... Yeah, man, the journey has been crazy. And I went from being a single dad of a 17 year, I mean, of a, uh, at 17 to fast forward to fostering and even adopting, um, seven to eight sons in my journey. So it's been a, it's been an interesting experience. I don't believe fatherhood. I didn't pick fatherhood. <laughs> I feel like it chose me <laughs> and I just been rocking with it, bro. To be honest with you, I just been rocking with it. So yeah. And that's why I use the phrase dad is not a noun because Yes, in the American dictionary, it is a noun, but mm -hmm. it's it's earned. You know, it's by your action, and so mm -hmm. that's the reason why I call it "dad is a noun." And um, the one thing I want to give you mad props and love on is that you know sometimes we hold grudges with our fathers because they're not in our mm -hmm. life. You yeah. wholly different. You know what I mean? You hold no grudges. You, yeah. you you know you hold no um anger or animosity towards him yeah. you're like all right yeah. he has his own story i don't know what it is i don't know what but yeah. at the same time i'm not going to use that as a clutch to hinder my my growth as a yeah. boy growing into a man raising a child and teaching my child to become a man as well as i'm learning to be a, becoming a man so i'm going to give you love and respect for that man because you're, yeah, you're like much rare, more. you're a rare, rare breed. Because you know, yeah. you know, growing up, a lot of kids they're, they're they're raised by their single mother, and sometimes the single mother will always say negative things about the father, like "oh, he's nothing," yeah. and yeah. those kids hold those um images and that and those and those um negative stereotypes about their dad, and they hold them for the rest of their life, and they hold that grudge as a, a reason why. I hate my father, but I'm not going to be like my father. And that's the way, the wrong way to look at it. So um, can you talk about that a little bit, how you didn't hold yeah. a grudge to, like, uh, evolve yourself as, a, as a, a father and a man? Well, the crazy part is, is that I had a, I was married to reject, rejection and fear. So I had this strong relationship with those two types of emotions and feelings. And so my mother never said anything negative about my father. What my mother did is she never really said anything about it. Right. And so I was really kind of left to my own device around how I would think about him. And I, I talk about this idea of uh, be sort of chasing shadows and right. that, you know, when you're a young person and you're chasing, trying to find that part of you that has gone missing. I was right. chasing um, chasing after my father through shadows. And you know anything about shadows, they shift change. Right. Um, and so, you know, if you're not careful and you're a young person, you can find yourself and caught up in all kinds of things because you're trying to figure out who you are. But man, the crazy part is, is that I did find my father. I actually found my father on um, on MySpace at the time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, <laughs> you don't even know That's about MySpace. Way back. Wow. Right. I mentioned MySpace, people are like, what? So yeah, man, I found my pops through MySpace. I, I had my father's name and I had my father's date of birth, but because I had yeah. such a huge fear of rejection, I just knew that if I would contact him, he would reject yeah. me. 
Um, and so I didn't, I didn't know what he looked like or anything like that, man. But on MySpace, there was there happened to be, and I don't even know. There's it's such a long story, but to shorten it up a little bit, um, my my brother, my little brother, had the same name as my father. And the crazy thing is, I found him, and I just I, I remember texting, um, messaging my little brother at the time, who I didn't know for sure, but I just told him, I said, "Hey, man, this is where my, my, my this is where my I was born." Um, my mother yeah. says. This is my father's name, and bro, man. if this if this is your dad and this is your date of birth, I think I might be your big brother. And wow. man, lo and behold, like not even a day, I remember just sitting by waiting for the message, and my little brother was like, "Yo, dad, looked at your MySpace page, saw your pictures, and he said you and him have the same eyes." And bro, that wow. was it after that. And I mean, when met my father, man, and it was like that whole Antoine Fisher movie when he goes home yeah. for Thanksgiving. It was just like that. I was looking wow. at them. The family was looking back at me like we're looking at each other. And right. I just remember going through my father's living room and noticing that I was not in any of the photos. So right. there were framed families, but I wasn't in them. And I think that is what um, started my journey with me and my father. And it's been difficult because I, I have, I mean, how do you, how do you love a man that you have no memories of? Yeah. Right. So I had to create those memories. Um, and so he and I, and then learning about my father, bro, the crazy part is, is that we're so much more, we're so much alike. And that's the right. power of DNA. So I love this dude, man. He, um, he He's he's amazing. And I, I just thank God to still be able to say that I have a father in my life. Um, and so we, we're just pushing forward, man. Just pushing forward. Because it's crazy because um, I almost have almost a similar story like yours, but not the same. Like, yeah. um, growing up, I usually had that mindset, like, every time, you know, my uh, birthday comes up, when I look in the mirror, um, that's the only time my father comes around. You know, I, I had that in my head all the time when I was younger, you know. But my mother never said anything negative about him. But I always wondered. Luckily, you know, I did have a stepdad there. But, you know, I always wondered. And what happened was kind of weird was it was uh, like New Year's. I think it was New Year's of 2012, I do believe. Yes. And before the ball dropped, okay. my uncle calls me and he say, hey, nephew, happy New Year. And all of a sudden I'm like, uh, can I talk to my dad? And he paused. It's like, all right, cool. Mm. He puts me on hold. And he has me on three way. And I finally get a chance to talk to my father. And the last time I saw my father was when I was like five years old and now um, 21. Wow. What was that like, the feeling of that? It was eerie because he, this man sounds just like me. It was like talking to a twin. And it was kind of creepy. And I'm like, oh, you know what? Um, I love you, Dad. Um, you know, Happy New Year's. Uh, he said, Happy New Year's to me. And that was it. And then wow. like four, four months later, he passed away. So I think things happen for a reason. You know, I, I'm not a person that believe in like the spiritual, but at okay. the same time, things happen for a reason. And I felt like he needed to talk to me before he can go. Wow, man. You know what I mean? And so... You know, that kind of hits me emotionally a little bit. But at the same time, you know, I kind of had my um, my rest in peace with him because I finally had that conversation with him. Yeah. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? And and it's luckily that he, your father is still alive. You still have that com conversation with him, even though yeah. it feels weird because you don't have that history with him. You know, he didn't yeah. teach you how to play ball. You didn't go fishing. You know, you didn't like watch wrestling or something like that. Like usually yeah. I have like dad and son have stuff in common, but at least you guys are still making a, a, a start so you can yeah. uh, carry a legacy. But um, moving on yeah. to another subject, man. Um, being that you, you know, being a child, raising, you know, a child. Raising a child. And so basically when you talk about, when I think of that, I'm thinking of uh, hierarchy. In every family, there's always a foundation. Yeah. And you being a, uh, a child raising a kid, I know you wasn't thinking about that then, but what do you think about that now, being that you are the matriarch of yeah. the family? But you didn't have a father, so it kind of started with you. So can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, that that's an interesting question because 
as a kid, you're not. I definitely wasn't thinking that. I I was really, and man, there were so many emotions I was going through as a kid. I was so happy to be a dad, but at the same time, I also felt like I didn't know what I was even doing. Um, right. And now when I look back in retrospect, when I look back on my journey, I recognize that I was making moves, bro. Um, not for myself, but for my for my son. So, you know, I was making moves in terms of, okay, what kind of, you know, if I go to this school, um, how will this impact him? If I, if I, I need to go to college, I, I need to find this kind of job. We got to move into this type of neighborhood. Um, mm-hmm. So it was always me making these moves to sort of make sure that my son had these opportunities mm-hmm. that... I know I didn't have, but I wanted him to have. Um, but it was also very challenging because I was also surrounded with systems who definitely didn't make things easy for me either. And so when, even when I talk about that, man, I think about this idea that I started out um, getting two hundred, what was it, one hundred and eighty-five dollars and fifty cent in like cash assistance and like two hundred dollars in food stamps. And I re- I remember this at sixteen years old and and. And then I'm going to a private Catholic school at that. Mm-hmm. So here I am. Um, my personal life looks like this, but I'm also going to this predominantly all white school where food stamps assistance. That's not even for some of these folks. They they don't even yeah. understand that. And then in my religion class, bro, they had us. They had them doing a flower baby. So they they walked around with a basket with a flower with a bag of flour in it, and that was their idea of what it meant to be a parent. And I'm like, wow. okay, I have to expose <laughs> my truth. Because right. these folks have to know that what I'm what I'm experiencing has to do a lot with legacy, even though I didn't know. I didn't even know what legacy meant. I didn't know that legacy was about everything that you do in the in the now versus you passing, bro. Um and I just remember thinking to myself, I don't really know what I'm doing, but what I am gonna do is I'm gonna my focus is gonna be on how to help my son navigate and, and have a better opportunity than I had. And um looking back on that now, it's like, man, I was making moves that I shouldn't, yeah. I, it's just kind of, <laughs> I'm like, wow. I mean, I just think about working two jobs and, right. and doing something for him what you know I wish would have been done for me. And it, it's been it's been a journey, bro. It's probably been it's been hard, right. um, but it's probably it's. I've just taken it, and every I feel like every challenge that I've had, I've had to use that as um, a stepping stool to to sort of help move and pivot my family forward. And so when I think back about that, man, I've been a nurturer my whole life. What I do, I take care of people. It's part of my makeup. Um, so it would make sense that I would be in the role that I'm in as a dad, to be honest. Um, and I, I love it. I love kids. And it's crazy. My father loves kids. So wow. he's a nurturer. It's like, I'm like, man, I, I never would have, you know, guessed that me and this man share the same type of um, experiences, even though we didn't grow up together. So it's just a part of the DNA, man. Yeah, yeah. That's a yeah. great question. Yeah. Yeah, man, thanks. And then also, like, as, you know, as you carry that legacy on to your son and your son is carrying it to his child, you yeah. know, and that's an important role to telling a story, which you are a great storyteller, yeah. and how legacy storyteller and being a black man and how is it important to write your story into what's going on right now when it comes to this new comic book that you're working on, Fatherhood. Man, let me tell you, your, your story <laughs> is so important, man, because I've been in situations where people have heard my story, man, and they will, organizations, I'll just say this, organizations have heard my story, man, and I remember people getting paid off my story because they'd have me come and present and I share my narrative. And then <laughs> I'm like, I get like a gift, a $20 gift card. I'm like, yo! <laughs> How are these people getting paid off our story? <laughs> uh, I was like, no, I got I to gotta take this back, man. And I really started to think about how do I tell the story? Um, and how do I start to capture, you know, just sort of taking back that narrative. And it's this idea that I discovered too, man, is that we have to take back what belongs to us. We can't expect other people to tell our narratives. We have to be in front of that. We got to be in front of the camera. We got to be behind the camera. We got to be the writers. We got to be the curators of our narratives. Um, and so once I started recognizing that, it just became something that I needed to do. And to be honest, man, you know, I take just a small part of the credit for this this comic book, man. This comic book is really dedicated to the young people that I have worked with inside the um, the juvenile detention center here where I work. Wow. Now we're a number of heads, man, but it really sparked from these young brothers, man, 
Um, I do a series that talks about fatherhood. And every time I even mention the word fatherhood or mention father, emotions, not positive emotions, but negative emotions would be curated through that, through that wave. And man, it was only until something hit me one day and I was like, okay, let me ask this question. And the question I asked them, I was like, so what would you think about your father, a black father being a superhero? If you could imagine him being a superhero, what kind of powers would he have? And man, I remember the room just being like electrified. If, if my father had superpowers, he would be he would be not at my football game, but he would be <laughs> at my sister's track game. Like he right. would he would duplicate himself and be everywhere. If my father was a superhero, he would be actively engaged. He would listen um, to my concerns and my problems. If my father was a superhero, he would um, he'd be able to cook dinner, make lunch, um, and do all these things. And I, it dawned on me, and I was like, man. Fathers are doing this. You know, fathers are at home. Fathers are present and involved. Fathers are emotionally nurturing and giving. But if you never see them, then you don't even believe they exist. And so the Fatherhood series was really created out of this narrative of men that I've worked with in prison, men that I've worked with in jail, um, men that uh, um, I work with closely in my profession that are amazing, dope superheroes, man, but their narratives never get told because of whatever their situation might be. And so these are just brothers that I know. And I, I just I just want to change that. I'm like, I want the world to also know them. Um, this book is also created to support literacy, man. I want, um, I not only want brothers to be able to read more, I also want people that don't understand our narrative to have access to this um, this um, comic book series as well, because I'm a firm believer that how we change the narrative is that we have to be the writers, and then we have to challenge people to be willing to to read up, read us differently. And so this, I only, I'm just taking a little bit of credit, man. I wrote the narrative, started on their journeys, brother, right. connected with other brothers who are artists, and said, "Hey, let's figure this out, and let's do this." And that's that's what it is, man. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. And, and and like I said, I love the illustration. Who 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 did the illustration? Bro, this is my brother Philip Johnson, man. But the crazy part is, man, I I never even met this man, bro. Oh, really? We, wow. We, we, we communicated. We I actually learned about him, man, through um, Chocolate City Comics. Oh, okay, um, okay. yes, I know about that. I'm not familiar with those brothers, yes, man. But they, I I contacted them several years ago, and I said, hey, this is my concept. Um, I, I need a I need a guy that um, understands what it means to be a father because I didn't want to partner with somebody who didn't understand it where I had to continue to tell the narrative. I needed someone who understood it, and they connected me with this brother man, and we've been just rocking just like this. And um, he, gets it, man. he gets it, man. He gets it, and so I have just been honored, man. And I'm excited to get the comic book out. Um, right. we're, we're near, we're getting really close, man. Um, and so it's just really been an uh, absolute true label of love for me to sort of see, um, these stories manifesting. But I want to change the, the negative stereotypes that come with, um, brown and black men of color and, and challenging these notions that we aren't who we say we are. Um, cause on face value, we absolutely are greater than what we know. And, um, part of my work is too, is helping young people and men understand how do I become something I don't see? Right. Well, the best, if you become something you don't see, brothers, is we got to put you in front of people who you can see it. Um, and, mm -hmm. do this. I love it, man. I love it. And then also, can you kind of tell me a little bit of the, 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 the I can't think of that word, but the, um, the synopsis of the, of the comic book. Give me a little background <laughs> of the characters and, you know, a little, like, um, a little background on the story a little bit, like the characters okay. and everything. Yep, so I've got a couple of characters, but the, the first issue is really about um, the character um, Dejan Jones. Um, okay. And actually, I mean, I'm sorry, Dejan um, uh, Divers. And that's a mixture of my one of my sons, both my sons, first and last names. Um, and again, I um, was a former foster parent and adoptive parent. And so I, I, I unfortunately, our family lost our son of DJ. Um, and so he became like the main character in this comic book. So actually, each one of the fathers that are in here are named after seven of my son, seven of the sons that I've had the opportunity to father. Um, and so yeah, D Dejan Jones is really uh, is my son's one of my son's names, and this is about 
his experience. And um, he even has a teacher that talks that he rocks throughout the comic book that says mental health matters. Right. Yeah. Um, because we know with youth in foster care, quite often what happens to them um, is that they experience a lot of trauma. Um, they experience a lot of um, I would even say a lot of trauma and sometimes even a lot of abandonment if they're moved from their families and community. And so Dejan in this comic book is really a 14 year old who is living with his grandmother and uh, he, he doesn't know where his father is. Um, he doesn't have a close relationship with his mother. And then he finds himself at the barbershop. And for me, the barbershop is the headquarters for this comic, this um, superhero league. Um, my barber is in this barbershop who is Dom. And so he's one of the main characters in this um, comic book series because I'm a firm believer that the barber um, is holds a lot of weight for um, yeah. black men in, the, in this community. And so for me, it's really telling the story of this 14-year-old sort of navigating his day um, interacting with these various um, elements that could set him back while at the same time starting to connect with um, a league of Black men in a barbershop and just sort of talking about the, the narrative of the barbershop in a very, very authentic, um, real way um, and sort of challenging barbers as well to recognize that they have such a, a valuable role to play in the community. They do. Not only as mental health providers, support support providers, but they also are great mentors too. And I just remember growing up in the barbershop and all the lessons that you learn just by listening. Yes. Um, just making the barbershop uh, a place where anybody can walk in there. And there was a time, man, when I used to think that the barbershop was just it was for everybody. And then I had a good friend say to me, yeah, the barbershop is really good for alpha males, but the barbershop may not be a safe space for the LGBTQ community or the trans community. And I was like, well, dang, I hadn't even really thought about that. And then, of course, I talked to my barber and he said, no, it's the barber's responsibility to make sure that he creates the climate for safety for all. And so I was like, OK. Um, then I can I can still rock with the barbershop. And so that's that's really important and near dear to me too, because I'm a firm believer that we can't talk about supporting brown and black boys and not support all brown and black boys, not just certain brown, brown and black boys that we feel comfortable with. Um and so that's the narrative, man. It's just a really just telling the story of this 14 year old and how he sort of navigates and sees the world and how the world impacts him and how he has been impacted by the space. Um, that he's in, and it's centered or centered really around um, him sort of finding his identity through those processes. Um, so yeah, it's and it's just my first my first one. My goal is to to uh, create at least eight comic books, um, eight comic books, and then turn it into a graphic novel, and then um, move into web comics and all of that stuff. I even got an action working with action, uh, great action figure, bro. So. Oh. I yeah, got, I gotta get it, man. I gotta get yeah. an action figure. Yeah. I'm yeah. a grown ass man with an action figure. I don't care. <laughs> man, listen, I, look. <laughs> we, we all kids, bro. We all kids. Yeah, at home. Man. <laughs> we really are, bro. We really, really are. And so, yeah, I mean, that's that's it, man. I just, I just want to tackle. I want to change the way we see things, and I want, I want men to read, and I want, um, I want, I want to see more of us building literacy. Um, so that we can fight that as well. So that's the that's the whole group. But I, I like how you touched the barbershop. I want to touch that a little bit. You know, growing up um, in the black community, you know, the barbershop is the mecca of every black community. Yeah. And with uh, gentrification, you you don't see as many black barbershops as much. Yeah. So can you talk about that? The 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 the, the 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 lack of black barbers in the community now than it was let's say 10 20 years ago yeah i mean i you're absolutely right this the, the the gentrification has definitely impacted the way that black businesses um are run um i mean i mean it goes far as back it's just economics too in terms of getting loans to support your business i think um you know, I, I can only speak for the experience that I've had here in my community here in Grand Rapids. Um, there are a number of barbershops um, that are located throughout the community. I don't think that's our challenge. I would say that the biggest challenge I think I, I have experienced is just sort of finding a barbershop, barbershop that really fits the, 
the um, the culture and the values of the of my family, and so right. that was that was like one of the big challenges that I had is that here I have four sons at home. What how much do I want to expose them to um, within the sector of the barbershop? Now we could go to a barbershop, but do they have the same type of values that um that I also uphold as a as a father too? Mm-hmm. And so that was really our challenge in navigating the um the barbershop scene. But man, you're you're absolutely right. Gentrification has definitely impacted where barbers um are within the communities that they the um that they reside in. So now with gentrification in a black neighborhood, you might not even this barber might have been pushed out. And so now if a family used to be able to walk to the barbershop, now they have to figure out how to get to a barbershop because is now miles and miles away um but i think again too man part of what i'm hoping to happen and what we've been experiencing lately um even this year is that there is some some movements coming and that we're we are we are saying that it's no longer okay to 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 operate in the way that we've been doing old business um and so i'm i'm hoping and i'm very uh i'm very hopeful that changes you know are coming but I, i do think too man we we just got a lot of work. Um, yeah. And I do think that it's not just us. I think that um, white America has a, a, a lot of work to do in terms of just making sure that um, opportunities are allowed and, and, and created for us and that we, we take advantage of those opportunities um, as well. So it's just, a, it's, a, it's a lot, man, but I, I think the barbershop is just a space for black men and, and black boys. And not even only that, but um, there's work to be done within those spaces too. And so I, I agree. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Because I think too, the one thing about the the black barbershop, it was also a job program too for a lot of the kids back in the days. That used to be like their first jobs, yeah. you know. Wow. And and I think you know because the lack of it and the lack of you know opportunities for like kids that's fourteen or fifteen, you know, due to COVID or anything like right now. But like a lot of kids are too young to actually get a job but the barbershop was a place where they would get their first check and kind of learn their 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 first knowledge of responsibility being on time mm-hmm. you know even as just sweeping up the the hair on the floor it was you know that was your work that's what you had to do yeah. whether it was for a couple of hours but that that was your work yeah and yeah and and that's another thing too, man. With limited job opportunities, it makes sense why we have young people, you know, responding and acting in some of the ways that they are responding and acting to, um, because there's not a lot for them out here um, to to participate in. And so you're absolutely right. The barber, the barber, it should be the first space that a young man goes to. Um, I I even have thought about the idea that it the barber is almost like a passport into could be a passport into what we call manhood even. Yeah. Uh, I also recognize that there's not a lot of rituals that support for uh, support black boys. And so this idea of how do we socialize boys um, without rituals um, is really important, which of course is why the gangs are so attractive, you know, that they have that ritual process that, you know, will allow a boy to grow into this man thing. Um, but I think, too, the responsibility that men have is, is just as great, too, which is why, you know, I talk about this idea of, you know, fathering beyond my front yard is that I recognize that I not only had to father the boys that was in my home, it was also my responsibility to father the boys within the community as well. Um, and so recognizing that, you know, all our boys within our communities are our sons. And so we we have a responsibility to them, which meant that we also have a responsibility for as men to be healthy too. And so that was just another aspect for me too, is just recognizing, oh, you can't just say that you're going to, you know, father, you also have to be a healthy father too. Um, and that required a host of stuff, bro. <laughs> healthy just, it, it, it also means mental health. And that also means, right. you know, seeking support and, yeah. Um, getting a therapist and um, just sort of really taking care of not just your physical health, but also your mental health, which is why this comic book is so important to me, because it does touch on some of those really heavy topics that are associated with black men, you know, sort of navigating the world and and, and its racist um, social systems. Um, yeah. So we, we have to acknowledge that there's a lot that happens to men of color 
um, when they are growing up in systems that, you know, sort of, that are, I mean, to be honest, just racist. So this, this series for me is, um, it's huge. And so I'm hoping to, as I'm developing this, to find young writers to come on board to really help me craft this, these narratives out so they, they align with, with brothers who are really living this life. Yeah. yeah, man. I'm just hoping this series become like the new radio. You know how, like back in the days, how the family would get together and turn a radio and listen to Little Orphan Nanny. I'm hoping this would be somewhere. You know, if it's like a digital book, like the family would just get together. Whether if you have it, an audio version of it, yeah. or like the actual physical copy, where they just sit down. Because right now. COVID, this would be the perfect time for fatherhood right now. Because, you know, family has nothing to do. You know, kind of bring back those Sunday those Sunday family times, you know, when family Sunday would have dinner and do something together Sunday. So hopefully fatherhood would, would become the, the start of something new in the Black community as well as the community, community as all, but um, going transition. Talk about because we were talking about the importance of the of the of the the barber, but also yeah. let's talk about your Delta project because you're doing a lot yeah. of stuff with the Delta project. You know, yeah, when I was man. talking about the barber, this is kind of that same um, conversation we were talking about how you know we play a role on raising young men. So can you talk about the Delta project? Yeah, man. So <laughs> again, it's something about that the detention center where I work, man, where I just get access to to young brothers. So again, that whole concept of this, you know, in the classroom talking about men of color and all the the men I know that are successful. I had a young man in 2017 say to me, "Mr. Cole, that's I don't I don't know no guys that you're talking about." So when I leave from this detention center, bro. The dudes you're talking about ain't in my hood, and I, was, I don't really see those guys. And I'm like, well, man, how do how do I help him see those guys? Um, because we we knew too, man, that a lot of our guys were coming returning back to detention because they had such positive relationships with men that worked in the detention center, right? right? And so the idea was like, well, how do we get them? connected to men that are in the community? And so the Delta Project was really built out of that question: How do I become something I don't see? Um, and I connected with um, a good friend of mine who we well, we were on the same board in terms of like um, it was a media board. And so we got together, man, and really started talking about some of the challenges and issues that I was seeing in my work. And um, we started aligning ourselves with uh, a film production company called Gorilla. And uh, before you know it, man, me and these two guys came together and we, we just sort of brainstormed brainstormed this concept of well, what what would it look like if we help boys sort of tell their stories what would it look like if we brought the film the film production team inside the juvenile detention center which is a very restricted place right what would it look like to have boys learn how to use the film equipment learn how to um use the cameras play around with light and sound what would it look like if we did that and write that we asked that question and before you know it, man, we were in the detention center. We were bringing in men that, you know, we, we deemed were successful in their own rights within the community and said, hey, we, we just want you to come in, have a conversation with the young man with the idea that it's going to be organic. You don't have to do anything but show up and be present. And then the goal is for you to extend your support within in a mentorship process. And, man, it's been organically, unbelievably beautiful, man, just to sort of watch those the, these interviews kind of come out of just a conversation of simply getting to know one another. And um, I think that's been the essence of our work is this idea of simply connection. You know, right. kids need to be connected to somebody. Um, there has to be somebody that is that will encourage them and walk alongside them. And sometimes that can happen with a mere conversation. Um, and so we under we forget and undermine young people, even though they're in detention. These are still brilliant, un untapped um, young people who sometimes have just taken a different route to get to their North Star. Uh, but yeah, man, the Delta Project was created through just that process. Uh, we have now become a 501c3, so now we're a nonprofit. And now, thank you, brother. The, I mean, 
If someone would have told me I would be putting out a comic book and running a nonprofit, I'm like, no, I'm not for real. <laughs> no, I don't even have time for that, right? But man, I'm telling you, when when it's time for you to do what it is you've been called to do, the you know the universe will open up for you. Um, and so, man, now we're just really looking at, okay, how do we pivot through the COVID nineteen? What are some yeah. things that we can do to support families and, and continue to support youth who are returning home from the juvenile detentions uh, yeah. centers? And residential programs here in our state um and that's that's the hope man and so yeah the delta project is my labor of love and i've just been able to work alongside people man who were just saying hey we're going to give you our time and our support because we believe in the work that you're doing and so that in itself feels that's a humble experience too bro to be to right. be able to do all this work and recognize that there are people that will support you and it doesn't care what race, culture it is, they will support you because they understand the heart of the work. And I think that's what matters the most, bro. So yeah, the Delta yeah. Project, by the look out for it. I yeah, am, man. I'm there for it, bro. I amazing. got one more last question for you. Go for this it. Go for it. One. Okay. I asked my friend Marcus Williams um, this question, okay. and I had him trump because he's like, uh, we got to do this another day because I got to think <laughs> about it. All right. All right. You're, 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 you're creating a new version of the X-Men, right? Not the, no, of the Avengers. Squat the X-Men. You, you're creating a new Avengers, right? And the Avengers wow. are based on historical black figures. And you know, in the original Avengers, was it four, right? It was Iron Man, mm -hmm. it was Thor, it was four. Hulk, and Captain America. Okay. So give me your four, whether alive or dead, historical fi figures that would be your original Avengers. Oh my! <laughs> do we have to do a part two? <laughs> Bro, if you, you want to do a part two. Right <laughs> <laughs> oh my! <God. sighs> so it's crazy, right? Because in my in my comic book, in the in the first series, I do have Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Those okay. are, I do have those two up. Now, man. Oh my gosh, bro. That's and it and, and also it doesn't have to be in the United States too. It could be Oh my gosh. Oh, uh, around the world too. It doesn't have to be just in America. <sighs> So so okay, because now you're making me think. You know, when I think when I think about my work, when I think about my work, bro, Gandhi comes to mind, man. Like this idea okay. of who you know what he represents, and um, yeah, man, that's ooh. If I had to pick my last one, and oh, I feel like I need more time. For that. Yeah, we might have to come back, bro, because I, I need to. Do that. Oh, that's a that's great question, good. man. Huh? That's a great question. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm a black nerd, and so I love uh, mixing history with, with comics, man. I think it's beautiful because it's a great way for people to learn about the history, but at the same time, be entertained at the same time. Yeah, man, because I'm stuck between, um, oh, man, James Baldwin, because that's my guy. That's, that's they, a good one. Uh, that, oh man, and I can't even think of my brother right now. I'm <laughs> my in my head. And you're going to have some, you're gonna have some black women mad at you if you don't have a black woman. I know. I'm looking at <laughs> It's crazy because I'm looking at my bookshelf and I'm like, where, where is it? Okay. We got to come back, bro. I don't doubt. I can't, I, can't have, I can't have black women mad at me, bro. So we don't, don't have to doubt, come. don't doubt. All right. The last question. What does a hero mean to you as a father? <laughs> Oh, what? Bro, I'm just gonna say this, man. I'm not I'm not trying to be Chris Wallace on Fox. No, man. Bro, you, you tripping, bro. <laughs> oh, man. You know, man, parents and I work a lot with parents, man. Parents are they are so vital in the lives of, of children. Like I, I have been doing so much work with working with parents, both mom and dad. And sometimes I think they don't necessarily recognize that they are real superheroes. Like what they do, what they say, how they behave, what they teach. Um, 
have such a lasting impression and impact on the children that they they share all of that with and depending yeah. on what they don't say and what they do say bro can can echo in children for a lifetime and so i've been doing so much work with adults who i recognize man are so have been hurt by the experiences of their own childhood and then they parent out of their childhood wounds and i, I just sort of I, I guess i've been learning that man real superheroes really have to do some real internal work like it, it can't be outside forces like the internal work is is the power and they young people need parents at such a at, at such a, a great level so i just i think parents are superheroes man that's um, right i love them i i, I love I, I love them and i'm always encouraging them because i recognize parents don't know sometimes i don't think they really know how important they truly 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 are it's not just about mother's day gift or father's day gift we are, we are, I'm a 41 year old adult and I'm still impacted by my mother's, you know, her, my experience with her growing up. That's because our childhood stays within us. So I would say if I had to give a superhero, give someone, anybody superheroes, it would be parents, man. They, they're superheroes. On all, on all levels. Yeah. On all levels. Bro, man, look, I, we got to do a part two, bro. I'm, we got to do a get part two, man. Me, but yeah. I, I, I definitely want to, what I want to do is um, in the future, I want to um, set up a Zoom conversation with yourself, Marcus Williams, okay. my boy, Demar Douglas, and sure. David Harada. He's a gentleman who uh, does the Heroes of Color and nice. the little, right. I want to mm -hmm. see if we can get together and do a Zoom conference and yeah. maybe you know, you know, you you know how you were talking about you were looking for writers. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we, we can get together and form like a a Justice League of writers and kind of, you know, you know, do something with the fatherhood. You know what I mean, bro? I can't make any promises, it. but I'm just let's, saying let's, I can only just start it. You know, just start yeah. the conversation. You know what I mean? I mean, look what you're doing now, bro. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> And when you start it, if you just end up doing it, so man, yeah, 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 no, you're right, you're right, man. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Once you drop that seat, bro, I was like, "Dad is what? Is, Dad is not a now." I'm like, "Who is this?" Brother? What are you, talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know what makes it funny is I have the shirts and like I'm rocking the shirt right in the store, and people are like, you know, it's a noun, yeah. right? I'm like. Yeah. Yes, that is. And then when I explain it to them, they're like, oh, yeah, now it makes sense. I like it. I like it. I'm like, all right, now buy the shirt. <laughs> no, right. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> that's, that's marketing man. brand 101 right there. <laughs> yeah, bro. I'm, I'm learning as I go, man. I'm learning as I go. I see someone says, how can I get a comic book uh, about the fatherhood? It's coming. I would say follow me on IG. Um, it's, we're hoping to have it released uh, by the end of um, September. So. Yeah, yeah. Brother, thank so, you, man. My, my pleasure, man. Just to let um let her know, uh, basically, to be continued. <laughs> yeah. To be yeah. continued. To yeah. put in to uh, a short phrase, to be continued. But, yeah, yeah. follow him on uh, Instagram, Cole Speaks. Follow yeah. him. Um, he'll definitely give you an update what's going on. And yeah. can't wait, man, definitely. Yeah. But let me yeah. let you go. Um, when we get off of here, uh, we'll connect behind the scenes and I'll do my best to set it up because I think you got something going and I think in this industry that we live in especially in the comic world we do yeah. need like a league of extraordinary black uh, writers, illustrators to form together just to create content about us and for us and that's I the common thing that I've been getting from a lot of people that I've been interviewing a lot is that we don't have that when it comes to that world. Wow. Yeah, man, let's let's make that happen. And I, I'm I'm a firm believer is not and not working in silos, but working collectively. So, you know, yeah. anything that I can do to help support the movement, I'm I'm all about it. So, yeah, brother, this is the first okay. of many. Yeah. All right, so, thank you, thank you, bro, thank you, thank you, man. All right, I'll talk to you later, bro. All right, sounds good, bro. All right, peace.